Welcome back, everyone, to the House of Hustle podcast here on Sports Radio 810. We are presented, as always, by our friends at Charlie Hustle, vintage gear made fresh, as well as capital investment management, providing financial and wealth management services. My name is Jared Sutton. I'm joined, as always, by Stephen St. John. Stephen, how are we doing? You know what? We're doing good. But, you know, I, I do a four-hour radio show usually right before we do the podcast. So I need something to lift me up. And my producer, Jake Gutierrez, swears by these ginger shots. And this is basically just you know raw ginger and cayenne pepper, and this will this will straighten your life out. It will it will also nearly make you vomit. If you're not ready for it. <laughs> I'm happy so, to be here for such an occasion to watch this. This we're on way. camera. I decided yeah. to do this. It's very powerful. Just think about just, just ginger and cayenne pepper. A lot of cayenne pepper. Yeah, and it's it's gonna know, hit. It's gonna hit. Oh, it hits. It feels. I don't know how it feels. But here we go. We're gonna figure this out live television, live radio right here. Oh my. That hurt. Deal with it. Ooh, boy. That stings. That's sti- well done, Jake. It stings the nostrils. It sti- How you feel? Feel okay? Hey, I feel great. Feel I feel okay. like talking some <laughs> basketball. So this, by the way, we were talking right before the podcast. Are you are you planning to go with Lebo on a little workout extravaganza? Yes, well, I went last week. Saturday? Okay. To base camp fitness, and it's a forty-five minute workout. Where it's nonstop, it's almost like a fight. As I like, it's fifteen rounds. Yeah, I'm on the bike, then you do a lift on the bike, do a lift on the bank, back and forth. Back and forth. We got an instructor with the, the you know, um, with, with the uh, headset giving you instructions, and they modify because I can't do everything with my lower back, you know. Yeah. And so the, yeah. You know, they got the straps for them. So yes, I'm not the Lebo's level. Jake, Jake and Lebo and I did it last week, but as you can see, I'm. I'm Commitment. I'm trying to get healthy. There you go. I'm trying to get right. All right. This is the Kangen water, the hydrogen water that that Jake bottles for me every day. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if I'm just. This is all. So you drink one of these a day? I try. I, I come up short a lot because I don't like drinking water. Right. This much. I mean, who does? But right. I try. So I mean, you know, it's supposed to get my mind right. <laughs> this this podcast is going to be turning into just like. How, how Jake gets Stephen right. Right. No you know, kidding. How the health gets back. Okay. Can I can I say one thing? Yes, since, please. Since this is basketball, congratulations to Northland Elite Platinum. That's right. I'm lucky enough to be the assistant coach under head coach Rick Parker. Uh, we were able to go to uh, Tulsa and win a, a big tournament, beat a couple teams from Oklahoma and a team from Arkansas, won the championship on Sunday on Father's Day. So I don't know if you can see this. Happy Father's Day there gift right is. there. How about that? No, no, you ain't kidding. I know. And we won uh, the championship game by four. So it's a close game, hit some big free throws down the stretch. My daughter Selena plays on the team, so it was a great way to spend Father's Day. And just another reason why I love basketball. I get a chance to coach youth basketball. I've coached them, and you've come out and given clinics and talked to both uh, my sons and my daughters about basketball. But I've been coaching them since second, third grade. Now they're in high school. It's probably it's it's a, sixteen and under uh, division. So it we brings won. it brings out a different competitive juices, right? When you're a parent oh, watching, you know, yeah. and and you're in the the competitive kind of timeline right now, right? She's just Selena just finished her freshman year. Yeah, oh yeah. So she's in it. She's playing um, school ball and club so basketball you know. is such a blast. So oh, it, just it, just it, talking it, to Selena about her teammates from yeah. the Northland, different schools. That's she, what that's what makes club ball so fun. She makes friends yep. uh, with school, you know, girls from other schools. And it, 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 it's, it's more than just basketball. It sounds corny, but it's more than just basketball. It's about life experience, getting a chance to hang out with, with kids you normally wouldn't hang out with, I, a great group of parents I get a chance to, to hang out with. And so what's going to be cool here is, I've, I haven't told you this, on an upcoming, uh, we're going to tape this pretty soon, uh, maybe in the next couple of days, uh, episode of, it's going to be a crossover of House of Hustle and Hot Mike. Because uh, we do crossover episodes. I like that. Get the ratings. I, li- I like it. Um, we're going to have uh, Coach Rick from Northland Elite on to talk about coaching youth basketball with our special guest, Jerron Rush. Oh, wow. And so we're going to be together. How about that? In that's studio a, that's big time. Because Jerron uh, does uh, his private lessons and kind of coaches some of the girls as well. Yeah. And so and when they, we had the tryouts for the platinum team, Jerron was there putting through the workout. So I'm trying to tell the girls, you need to understand. One of the best players to come out of Kansas City. Jerron right. Rush. Right. One of right. Hands down. Hands down. And so we're going to talk basketball, talk about coaching kids, coaching girls, and then we will get into Jerron and and mm. what it was like to be 
the man when he was in high school. He was the man. And I, I remember him going to UCLA with Earl Watson, another that's Kansas right. City name. Oh, that's exactly right. And they were uh, they were dynamic. That was a, a great era of high school basketball in Kansas City, too. A lot of great players yeah. in that era. You know, and speaking of, of local ties, there were some local ties to the Boston Celtics that won the NBA championship. We had our man Phil Pressey, who was a guest. Yeah. On this, this year. on this podcast this year, we talked about him being an assistant for the Boston Celtics. So he wins a ring. You had uh, Jason Tatum, St. Louis kid on the team. You had uh, Svi Mikhailuk, yeah. who uh, played at Kansas, of course. And then you had uh, maybe my favorite uh, tie, somewhat locally, uh, Jalen Brown, who played his college ball for Conzo Martin. That's right. Uh, That's so, right. Look, hey, Boston, I wasn't rooting for Boston. I wanted Dallas to win. But maybe at the end of the day, I was rooting for Boston because of all yeah. these local ties. And they went 16-3 and three in the postseason, and they were dominant. Yep. But I wanted to ask you, it doesn't I – mean, I don't think the media is playing it up like, boy, this is an all-time great team. Look at the dominance. Look at the playoff record, 16-3 and three on this run to the NBA championship. Why aren't more people talking about them being historically great? I think it's because when you look at, like, I don't want to put the media, because I think fans are this way, just sports fans in general. There was a lot of games that were blowouts, right? And I think fans want to see playoff games that are down to the wire, those clutch moments, game-winning shots, you know, the kind of the excitement and the adrenaline of having a close game in the playoffs. Compelling series. Exactly. And it just felt like that might have been missing. And reality was Dallas was a great team uh, with two premier players, Luka Doncic in the playoffs. I think he led the playoffs in points, rebounds, assists i mean he was dominant throughout the playoffs he did not lead in defi- defensive he did not though. he did not leave lead in that category unfortunately but um you know Kyrie Irving NBA champion and the, the storyline of Kyrie going to, back to Boston i think that was a really interesting takeaway from the final series but I, I think it comes back to just these these playoff games and it showed up in the finals where it just the way these games went um even when Boston lost you know game what was that four down 48 points. I mean, it just wasn't really all that compelling. Um, but when you actually look at and break into the numbers, you know, the Celtics on an all-time run this season, regular season, postseason combined, you know, they, they, what they did this year is really remarkable. Um, and give Joe Missoula and Brad Stevens a ton of credit. Um, but I, I, I think just the way that the playoffs went and just how the finals went, you could look at it and think, well, that was underwhelming, but it really just speaks to how good Boston was, in my opinion. And I think Dallas would tell you the same thing. So maybe they, would they have got more credit if they had to go through, like, if they played Denver, the yeah. defending champs. Yeah. You know, a team that is now, you know, and I don't agree with the Dallas is getting criticized. Well, they, just, they didn't have a worthy opponent in the finals. And, like, look, I thought Indiana, if they yeah. had stayed healthy, they were a handful. They gave Boston all they wanted, but they kept falling apart in the last few minutes of games. Right. Uh, but maybe it's just, I don't want to say it's luck, but they they they, they were on the uh, uh, receiving end of some good luck when it came to injuries to key opposition. Um, but at the end of the day, they only lost three games in the playoffs on right. the road to a championship. And what, 21 overall? Yeah. Was that, I mean, that's, that's, right. that's something special. Yeah. The margin for error, too, like in the playoffs – as you get through like each series, like this thing can be so fragile because of health, and that was a takeaway of the playoffs. I mean, I'm I'm curious what the East would look like if Giannis is playing, right? If he's fully healthy, what does that look like? Um, you know, Jimmy Butler was banged up. There, there's you can go on and on. Um, the West very similar. You know, there was a lot of guys banged up in the West. So, but that's not an excuse because you know Boston was able to withstand, and Porzingis was banged up, and they were able to still win a, a finals championship without what I think was their kind of X factor, and I, I call it the cheat code with Porzingis, um, and how they were able to acquire him, too. We'll get into that in a, in a bit. But the dominance of Boston um, in the playoffs really speaks for itself. Um, you know, I, I go back to the year prior, and Joe Mazzulis talked about this when they were down 3-0 against Miami, uh, they came back, made it 3-3. They lost game seven. Jason Tatum went down in the first few minutes with an ankle injury. But I think Joe Mazzullo really learned a lot. And coaches, Joe Mazzullo is 35 years old. So he's he's my age. And I think coaches can really learn a lot. Like once you get into the playoffs, you're, you know, your first year head coach, maybe second year head coach, and you get that playoff experience, 
under your belt. It's different than the regular season. Everything goes up and the game plan and the strategy and how you build up towards the playoffs, how you keep your team motivated, um, how you're able to the season being such a marathon, like how you take the season for what it is and the spurts you go through positively and negatively. Um, but Joe is such a great coach and I, I, th- I like hearing just how he coached this season differently than a year ago. I've talked to Phil Pressey about this. We talked about it on the podcast. I think he's learned from past experiences. He understands now, and I think you saw that in this playoff series, of number one, the Celtics played so much faster than they usually did a year ago. Um, they understood how to put Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum together. Uh, and then the unselfishness of the team in general It comes back to Drew Holiday, who we had in New Orleans, who goes to Milwaukee, won a championship in Milwaukee, and then won a championship in Boston. It was a huge deal at the time when they got Drew in the trade. Uh, Championship caliber player, Derek White, championship caliber player. caliber player. Um, I even think their role players like Sam Hauser, like Peyton Pritchard, like those guys were really impactful for it throughout the season. They They had a very unselfish nature to them where winning was first above all of that. And notice that I think... So much was made of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum of, well, Tatum's, you know, the guy that needs to be the MVP. Tatum's the guy that needs to drive the team forward. He's a superstar. Well, Jalen Brown signed a massive deal last summer, and Jalen Brown is a – he got significantly better, like, this year. He cleaned up the handle. Um, They were way more efficient as an offense in terms of ball movement and sharing the ball and not just being so much ISO heavy in terms of one-on-one. And I think Brown and Tatum and how that fit with Porzingis and all these pieces – Joe Mazzulla deserves a ton of credit for that because this team was not that a year ago. Um, so, yeah, they have all the pieces, and you know they're flirting with the, the second apron in terms of the cap and the new CBA. But it still comes back to how they they played and operated together and, and won a championship and stayed consistent throughout it, which is the hardest thing to do. When you go, you know, what, what is it? The Celtics are the 14th team to win 80 games. They had a 79% win percentage. They outscored their opponents by 10.7 points per game the entire season over 101 games. They had the most 50-point wins, 40-point wins, 30-point wins, and 25-point wins in NBA history. Like, that's dominance. Um, And then to hold a 20-point lead in 50 of the 101 games, including the playoffs, that's rare company. (laughs) Like, that's rare to be in. That's top five stuff when you look at NBA history all the time. You know what's interesting about Missoula? Uh, And I I didn't – I don't know. You you – over the years, you start to forget things, right? Yeah. But I, I I had forgotten he was one of the stars of the West Virginia team that went to the Final Four under Bob Huggins. Yep. And that wasn't that like you said that wasn't that long ago. Nope. But but they beat us in the tournament. He he. he I hate to bring it up, but they went through us why, in 2010. You, like, I mean, I, I didn't know if you. I just I just like, hey, uh, remember hey. Missouri. I just like I was shared shared the floor with Joe with Joe Missoula. He was a really good player. I'm so I'm going to ask you about that, but. An interesting story that I that I found, and you always talk about the impact your, your college coaches had on you, yeah, right? Right. And so he he started his West Virginia career under John Beeline, mm-hmm. who I used to always wish would come to Missouri. He's a St. Louis guy, right? No question. What a great coach. No question. And they won the NIT there. He had a bad shoulder injury that almost ended his career, came back from that. Then uh, he, he got in some trouble and was suspended by the team by Bob Huggins, mm-hmm. another great coach, another right? Another great coach, yeah. And so when he was suspended, I guess the story goes that Jerry West, who recently passed away, the logo, called Missoula. And, of course, Jerry West is a former West Virginia great. RIP. Called Legend. him and, and kind of got after him and told yeah. him, hey, you're not living up to expectations. You're blowing it, son. You're blowing this chance. You have too much talent. Don't blow this opportunity. And Missoula credits that phone call, that conversation with Jerry West, for turning his college career around and then helping, uh, you know, West Virginia get to the final four and now look at him winning a championship uh, with, uh, with Boston as a head coach. But just think about that. John Beeline, Mm -hmm. Bob Huggins, Jerry West, all impacting when he was a kid, impacting his, his basketball career. And so I'm quite sure when you have that type of, of that wealth of knowledge to pick from, just think of those influences that turn yeah. you into a great head coach, and then you were on the court with him. Yeah, so I'm not look. I, I wasn't looking to go down this road, Jarrett. <laughs> but tell, well, take me back to Missoula and what you guys yeah. faced against West Virginia. Well, I, I actually pulled up the box score this morning because I I knew we. 
we didn't play our best, but I, I honestly think West Virginia had a lot to do with that um, in that game. West Virginia had talent. Um, Joe came off the bench, actually, and uh, was very good in that game off the bench. Undersized point guard. Like, definitely a guy that exuded toughness, um, physical guard, unselfish guard. Um, you know, we all we talked about Jamal Shedd, right, in terms of when we were talking about the NCAA sure. tournament. I think that, um, you know, I think Javon Carter, right? When you look at West Virginia guards, like Javon Carter kind of fits this mold, and, you know, it's something Bob Huggins and John Beeline too, but Bob Huggins would recruit, and we talked about this with Coach Anderson on, on the podcast. Coaches sometimes, and I think it's a good thing, they want to identify players that fit, and fit can be a word that is overused. It can be a little bit cliche, but it's also the truth. Like finding guys that fit your system, fit your culture, fit how you want to coach, um, meet the standard, meet the expectation that you're looking for in a player. Uh, and that was Joe Missoula. And look, <laughs> can you imagine getting a phone call from Jerry West? I mean, my gosh, right? Like, that, that just that changes the game. For for me, if if I'm just putting it kind of. This is, reminds me of Norm Stewart talking to us. This reminds me of Nolan Richardson coming into our locker room. You better listen. You listen to those guys. Those are Hall of Famers, and their message rings clear when they talk. You listen. Uh, and when I look back on it, I was 19, 20 years old. But when they walked in the, in the door, it was like, wait a second. Some, there, there's royalty in the building, uh, and that's kind of how you looked at it. But, you know, it, it's something that you bring up because even – some of the comments Joe has made throughout the playoffs and in, in the final series, like Joe Missoula, Missoula is authentically himself. I come back to that because that's how he was as a player. And sometimes how a, how a player is on the floor reflects how they are off the floor. That's not always the case, but in most cases, sometimes it, it reflects that. Um, JT Tiller, right? Like tough, hard nosed, blue collar dude on the floor. He's that way off the floor. Uh, he's a high school coach himself. Great high school coach. Um, with Joe, he made a comment in the playoffs that really stuck with me. Um, he said, you, you, you run towards the uncomfortable. Like, you shouldn't fear being uncomfortable. You should run towards that. And you need to meet adversity and run through adversity. That's what He, with this team, he, specifically the Celtics that won it this year, he challenged them throughout the year. And he, players have said that he would create stressful moments. Like, when they were winning and blowing teams out, he would try to shake up stuff. He would try to, you know, get get players uncomfortable, whether it be in practice, whether it be in film. He would try to create stressful moments throughout the year to see how players responded, to watch players talk to each other, to see how players would respond to that. Because um, he didn't want his team to settle and be content. And to me, that speaks to this whole story of Joe Missoula as a player. Um, Jerry West, his comments to him as a player, um, obviously the coaches with, with, with Beeline, um, and why he went to West Virginia. And West Virginia, just that's what they exude is toughness. And that's that's how I picture West Virginia basketball. Yeah, especially with Huggins. Got especially with Huggins. Um, and there's been a lot of players. Um, you know, Miles McBride was playing in the playoffs for the Knicks, having great moments. West Virginia kid, super tough. Super tough. Very talented, too. So you, you, you kind of peel back the onion, and, like, success is driven by what we're talking about, like coaches making an impact on players. Coaches try to find ways, and sometimes they reach out to other coaches or they reach out to players that they had, alumni that played for them, to get involved. Melvin Booker did this when we were in college. Melvin Booker sitting down with Marcus Denman and Kim English. Like, those things matter. It's why I always stress, and I've told you this, that I do believe, and I, I think there's coaches that sometimes miss this and have missed this, when you are the head coach of a Division One program, you have got to get involved with your alumni. You have to tap into your former players. You have to bring them around. You have to, because that's going to drive more than you think. Um, you need that support, and you need them to be a part of the program and help with where you're trying to go with your current players. Because your players understand the game. They've watched games. They grew up watching teams, just like I did, just like you did. And you look up to those guys. You look up to those players, and you look up to those coaches. So it, it, it ties into... Joe Missoula is 35 years old, and he just won an NBA title. He's not going anywhere. And he took over a Celtics situation that was a little bit chaotic with what took place with the old head coach, right? With everything that took place within the front office, with, with, within the organization, that was a bad, bad look for the Boston Celtics. And he had to take over that with a team that was a championship team. Make no mistake about it. He was inheriting great players and a great group. But he had to get this team over the hump of what they did last year, and Joe took full responsibility of them losing to Miami 
last year when Miami was an eight seed. So it, it's a really great story of just a great cro- great coach, great person, great player. And then for, I don't know how many people realize in, in the 2019, 2019, not that long ago, NCAA Division II tournament, he was the head coach of Fairmont State. Yeah, yeah. He coached in the G League too with the main Red Claws. So, I mean, his, his path – a quick plan. He's, he's accelerated up the path really fast. I mean, just like um, go go to the Division Two tournament oh man. like this year and yeah. say, in yeah. five years, one of you guys is going to be the head coach for the NBA champs. Yeah, like, yeah whatever. <laughs> right, right. Of the Boston Celtics, mind you, right. uh, one of the most you know now the winningest franchise in the NBA. So, it's a it's a remarkable story. There's no doubt about it. But I I, I think too like in the same breath with Joe Missoula, Brad Stevens needs to be talked about here, right? As a, a former coach of the Celtics. Great, great coach that moved to executive. Not the easiest thing because it's different when you're an executive from a coach. You have to have kind of a different lens than the coaching side of it, and it's very tough tough to decipher that. But some of the moves that that he made, especially like keeping Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum together. Retaining Missoula. Retaining Missoula, absolutely. Um, you know, making the deal for Drew Holiday, making the deal for Przingis, making the deal for Derek White, and also like at the time he traded Kemba Walker, who was – a good player that, you know, he, he traded away Malcolm Brogdon, who was, you know, Grant Williams. These are good, good pieces that he moved on from to elevate into, into better pieces, into better rotational players. Um, so Brad deserves a ton of credit. I think, too, when you look at, like, two-way players, the two-way contract, if you're undrafted, you have a chance to sign a two-way or an Exhibit 10. What today's NBA is is, you have got to hit not just on the players at the top of the draft. You also have to hit on players either late second round or undrafted. Like the undrafted market is so huge because at some point, one of those guys is going to help you. You're going to have to have one of those guys help you because it's such a long season. Health is a part of our game now where guys are going to be banged up. you got to count on guys. So I always, you know, when we're, we're in these conversations, we're talking about the draft here, drafts in a week. That undrafted market, that undrafted player if you go undrafted, it should be a little bit motivating because of where the NBA is at. There's a lot of two-way players that have really impacted games, especially in the playoffs. Sam Hauser is a big one. And now teams are talking about, like, how do we find that Sam Hauser piece? Well, not a lot of people were talking about Sam Hauser three or four years ago when Sam Hauser was going through the draft process out of Virginia. So um, how they put this team together really speaks to, like, and yes, they are a team that's in the tax. They have paid. that. Like They, they are a team that is built to win. Um, but they have done it right. And you go back to to the 2016 draft, the 2017 draft, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, both third overall picks. Like, you know, Boston drafted them and then kept them, paid them. They're ingrown, in-market, in-house guys that have been able, as a one-two punch, and, I mean, to think about the unselfishness you have to have where Jalen Brown wins the finals MVP. Jason Tatum's probably thinking, like, yeah, I really want to have, I want to be, but, he doesn't really care. Like there is no ego there where those guys are close. Now they, they are play really well off of each other. Jalen Brown is definitely the defender that they have to have. And he's such a great shooter and score. Jason Tatum's a superstar. You know, the, the run that Tatum had this playoffs, pretty historical in terms of total points, like in this playoffs, which I found interesting and just kind of diving into it this morning like the most points scored in the playoffs right now with Jason Tatum, he scored 2,700 points. That's number one by a player 26 and under. Number two on that list, Kobe Bryant. Number three on that list, LeBron James. Like that's a historic playoff run from Jason Tatum. That's a that's a greatness run uh, by one of the league's best players, and he's still young by age for where Tatum's at in his career. So clearly, they were built to win this year. Are they are they built to to win? Multiple championships? Is this a team that could be a championship contender for for a few seasons? Or do you think it's going to be difficult for them to repeat? Well, I think it's interesting that Al Horford already said he's coming back. And I do believe... He's 57 years old. (laughs) It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. The 2007 draft. um, I was a senior in high school. Like, it's incredible. Um, You know... (laughs) thinking back too of like the Florida teams under Billy Donovan. Right. You know, he's been a part of some great teams, the Florida back to back run. Um, you know, I I think too when the journeyman conversation with him, Drew Holiday's now in this conversation. Like Drew's now a two time NBA champion, two different teams. 
I think everybody kind of gets that Drew Holiday is the ultimate glue that can win you a title as like a third piece around two stars. He did that in Milwaukee with Giannis and Chris Middleton. He was their third piece. And they don't win a championship in Milwaukee without him, in my opinion. Like, he was huge for them in the playoffs as a passer, as a third option scorer, and then as an elite defender. Six-time all-NBA defense, right? I mean, he's that good on both sides of the ball, and he's an ultimate leader, and he's competitive, and he's tough, and all these traits. Well, that's Al Horford, too, in his own right. He's, he's evolved into this great backup piece, and he had to be impactful in the playoffs with the health of Porzingis. So the fact he's back is good. Um, we talk about role players. Porzingis, um, you know, banged up. He's a guy that was a great rim protector for this team, shot maker, um, for a true seven-footer in the modern-day NBA game, he fits everything. He can pass, he can shoot, he can score off the bounce, he can score on the block, he protects the rim, he rebounds. His health is a factor because, I mean, the Celtics are able to win this, but they needed Porzingis in game one, who was great. I still think this series would look much different if Luka Doncic doesn't foul out in game three, right? Like, I think that's this, and I hate to be hypothetical here, but, like, how that game was going could have changed the series – but then the Celtics won, I believe that would have been game, was it game three or game four? No, they lost game four. It was game three without Porzingis too, with the health being a factor. With no no, no Porzingis on the floor, they're able to win that game. To me, that ultimately, I think, dictated the series in many ways. But how, if the Celtics can stay together and stay healthy, they'll have a chance, yes. They'll have a chance to repeat. But we want, we said the Nuggets were in a, uh, had a chance to repeat. That's how good the NBA is right now. The parody thing is a conversation. Well, that, that's, to me, what gets missed sometimes is like, well, the NBA playoffs, it wasn't as appealing as you want it to be. The finals weren't great, and it's true. But end of the day, the talent level in the league and how competitive the West was was just a monster. The East is still very good. Health was a part of the playoff conversation, um, but the Celtics were the best team all year. I I'm curious to see if they can replicate that. that that's going to be tough to do. Okay, I'm going to throw you a curveball here. I know you have some other topics you want to talk about. You mentioned Florida, and so that, that triggered in my mind a question I want to ask you when I saw this. This, this kid that's, that's committed to Florida, mm-hmm. who's yeah. a Guinness Seven. Book of World Record holder for tallest teenager, they, he's listed at 7'9". Yeah. He was 6'1 when he was, uh, when he was 8 years old. He's from Montreal. I mean, have you seen much of this kid? It's from IMG Academy. Yeah. I, I um, mean, is it, he's seven. I mean, <laughs> like we're gonna see him playing against Mizzou. I have not, I'm not. I'm he's not seven nine. He's seven nine. Uh, my question is, uh, should he wear the jersey seventy nine? He should to, to repli- they're, they're replicate replicate Con- Connor Vanover in the seven five. You know, like, I was watching some clips of him, and he's just he's literally just standing there and throwing <laughs> yeah. the ball. He doesn't even jump. I mean, he just, just catch and finish. Off. I don't, I'm, like, I'm, I don't. It's, I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated. It's like taco, you know. It's like taco yeah. fall back in the day. Um, but he's this guy's seven nine. So I know it's a little different. A little different. So I, I, I'm curious. I've, I've never. I've not seen him live. I've seen some clips of him, and I mean, he's got some touch for his size. But um, I am. I am fascinated to see how he handles the SEC. He comes from a great pro. IMG Academy, great, great developmental program for amateur high school players. Um, so. We'll see. SEC is a different deal. It's going to be very interesting. Um, but, you know, a guy that has great size, and you need size in the SEC, that's for sure. Mike, I'm curious of just the rim protection thing. If, if he's, like, the, the, the dunking and the finishing, but can he protect the rim? Can he play in a drop? Like, all those type of things. Because the SEC, a little different than high school. In right. terms how of many speed minutes and physicality, how many minutes can yeah, he play? Yeah. Can he stay healthy? All those things are going to be a factor. We've seen other tall players not have much of an impact. So, but Exactly. Like, the interesting. Device. The name of the game is mobility too. When you're that size, can you move? Uh, because the game is so fast. Right. That, that's and now with coverages and how offenses are run, you can be exposed too. Um, so can he stay on the floor? We'll see. All right. So uh, some other topics you want to talk about? Uh, NBA expansion. One of your favorite topics. Favorite topics. Yeah. I I wanted to get ta- my hopes up. I wanted to talk about this because Adam Silver brought this up. I got uh, all pissed off the other day. You know, when these politicians now, Kansas and Missouri, talking trash, and one of the Kansas politicians started, oh, Missouri's known for losing, for losing teams. teams. Yeah. And I didn't have any reaction until he said the Kings. I said, you know what? Watch your mouth. That's right. You don't need That's to talk exactly about that. Right. Because I cried. 
when I was 10 years old when the Kings left for Sacramento. And so, sir, you need to watch your mouth and leave the Kings out of your mouth. Yeah. That's still a sore spot for me. It, so don't, get, don't get my hopes up about this. Oh, it's a sore spot for me as well. When he, I, I, when I thought about the teams in terms of the state of Missouri and teams that have left, the Kings won rings. I, I know I'm biased with that, but, like, to lose a team to Sacramento and lose a team – that like looking back on the Archibald era, right, and like what could have been the Magic Johnson story of the draft and Kevin Harlan calling games. My gosh, I mean, I wasn't around for all this, by the way. You, I, but so, it, it hurts so cool, me. Yeah. It hurts me. So cool they left right before Jordan took the league over. <laughs> I mean, right, great, great, exactly. Great timing. The timing of this, and I know it was a totally, you know, Kevin Harlan has said this. Like it was a totally different time then. The facility, yeah. how the burn the Celtics, Showtime it, Lakers, it, Michael Jordan, it, yeah. Bad Boy Pistons, none of it. All right, bye. The league just took off after that, um, <laughs> and I mean, just the, the thought of having an NBA franchise here and the NBA expanding and Adam Silver saying that time is now worth 30 teams. So you're thinking 32 adding two. And is that, um, is that it? We don't, we don't know if it's the it. We don't know if it's it. The thing is the, 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 the factor of that's in play here is the NBA is now 20% of players outside the country. So it is a global game now. And the town, I mean, the talent level, we're about to have a draft, and there's a good chance that two of the top three picks are going to be international players. They're going to be players from France, Australia. Um, you know, there's obviously you think of Serbia and you think of the players that have come out of Europe that are now impactful players with Jokic, Luka Doncic, you know, Giannis. The list goes on and on and on. Wimbenyama. <laughs> you know, Wimby. look at look at him last year. My gosh, look at where the where he's going to be in two, three years. My gosh, it, it's hard to really think about that. But right now, the league sees this as like, wait a second, our league now, from a talent standpoint, is just growing and growing and growing. Expansion makes too much sense. Who are the favorites? Seattle and Las Vegas are one and two right now. They're the favorites. That doesn't mean that something can happen. I think Seattle should be yes a foregone conclusion. Like that makes too much sense. I think Seattle one hundred percent. Vegas, to me, I'm not sold on, and I know I'm probably in the minority on that, But I, because I, I, I understand the Raiders are there, the Knights are there, baseball's in the conversation there, WNBA with the Aces, uh, you know, th they are a great expansion franchise in the WNBA. I still sometimes think about where the league sits right now and just the hodgepodge that is the teams in the West and trying to find balance between the Western and the Eastern Conference and the MBPA will make decisions on this about how this fits in terms of travel, player health, all the factors that go into this. Relocation could be on the table. We don't know what that'll look like. But I do think Kansas City's in the conversation in terms of being a team that can can be in the conversation. Doesn't mean they're top one or two. But in terms of them being third, fourth on that list, that to me is realistic. Um, Louisville will be mentioned. Mexico City will be mentioned. I'm, you know, I'm assuming Canada will come into the conversation. Maybe Vancouver um, you know, that was explored in the past, right? But when the Grizzlies were in Vancouver, Toronto has been a great success um, in terms of basketball in Canada. We've seen a lot of Canadian players now in the league. So again, it, it touches on just the fact that this game, the game of basketball is so big now, the talent coming to the NBA is high. And how do we capitalize on that in the right ways? Because it used to be like, oh, well, if you expand, it's going to be watered down. I don't think that's going to be the case. I, I really don't. I do think right now where the NBA sits, it is highly competitive. We need to do more as a league, for sure. There are other avenues of like capitalizing on that. But to me, expansion makes a lot of sense. And Kansas City can be in this conversation. Okay, can I ask you a question submitted by Selena St. John that I did not think I would ever ask you, but I'm going to ask you? I can't wait. You know, I think you know what it is. So before we go and play uh, the second day of our tournament, down in uh, down in Tulsa, we're in the hotel lobby waiting to leave to head over to the gym, and it's, it was like a cool moment, one of those snapshot moments, right? As a parent, you got a bunch of parents down there, a bunch of the girls, and in the hotel lobby on the big screen is uh, the game between Indiana and Chicago, WNBA. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh huh. And Caitlin Clark, right? And so, and, and we're why and, and everyone's locked in. Right, and and it's still for watching them. And we're getting ready to go play, and like you know, all the dads, hey, watch Caitlin do this, and look at her court vision and that, and everything else. And I'm like, this is so freaking cool. And for people that don't 
under like you know, th- th- that comment that keeps popping in my head from that player that said, well, besides three pointers, what does she bring to the table? Fans, oh my gosh, viewers, people that care, uh, you know, engagement, all of it, right? All and we're of it. sitting there watching this, and I'm like, this is awesome. And so then, Cell asked me, "Can Kansas City ever get a WNBA team?" And I said. That's a really good question. Great question. Yeah. I'm going to ask Jared Sutton that. So, obviously, we want an NBA team. Yeah. But, you know, now with Caitlin Clark, and you've got some other stars coming through college basketball, and she's not going anywhere for a while. Yeah. Is that is that a, is that a ridiculous question? I don't think it's – no, not at all. I, I think it's a fair question. Um, I, I don't see why not. I go back to – and this is NBA and WNBA. But, but, the, but the league has, has struggled. It has struggled, yes. Here, but, and it's going to have to – but she's changing things. No doubt. Right? Absolutely. And I do think this is, and I know this whole Caitlin Clark thing at the WNBA, and I knew it, I knew it was going to be this when we, and you know this, when she was playing at Iowa and going through the tournament this year, my gosh, the uh, I mean, the, the ratings speak for themselves. <laughs> Number one of the amount of eyeballs that were on her games, um, especially in that Elite Eight Final Four run, all the, all that. Um It's not just Caitlin Clark, obviously. Like, Asia Wilson should be the face of the league. She's a stud. Like, the league... Again, has I think Caitlin has the Steph Curry factor. Um, I've said that before. Like, and a- a- Angel Reese, Angel Reese, the rivalry sure. there, absolutely. You know, Cameron Brink, who just I know she just tore ACL, but she sucks. Oh that yeah, sucks. But she's great. It's like she's one of the better rim protectors in the WNBA. You know, and then when Juju gets here, like there's like oh, it's man. right Ju- when Juju gets there. Yeah, look out. I mean, that, that's to your point. Like it's not just where it's at right now; it's where it's going. Um, I look at this market of Kansas City, and you can speak to this, and I I'm curious to get your take on this. You can't tell me like. Kansas City is a passionate, passionate sports market. It's proven. Just like Seattle is, right? You know, like when you, you talk about the, the Seahawks and the Dust Bowl level and the Chiefs at Arrowhead, the Dust Bowl. Like, the fans get behind their teams, right? It's it, you, you look back, I, I've talked to Nick Collison about this when he was with Durant and Russ, that final game. They were on the floor in Seattle when they were making the transition to Oklahoma City. And the, the arena's packed, and, like, they loved their Sonics and – there's a huge committee in Seattle that's trying to get an NBA team back, and have, they've been doing this for years. But I, I do believe that, like, fan support and what's outside of the Kansas City area, when you get into Nebraska, into Omaha, into Kansas, into Wichita, into Des Moines, um, when you go down to Springfield, when you go to Columbia, there's all these these markets, too, that surround Kansas City that come to Kansas City to for Chiefs games, for Royals games, for sporting games, for current games. Like, this... This town is, and, and I think it's just Kansas City that keeps growing. Like, it, it, it's progressing in all the right ways. New airport, World Cup. World Cup's coming to Kansas City. People are starting to figure it out that Kansas City is a great, great market and a great sports town. To me, that is something the league is needing. They need a market that has a legit bona fide sports fan base and sport, like a, a sports town that is passionate about their teams that support their teams. And and there's no better market than Kansas City. And Seattle's in the same conversation. Vegas, I don't know. Like, I, I think Vegas is great for football because it brings fans to Vegas. It's a weekend getaway. They're right. great. You look at a Raider game, it's probably 60-40, the opposing team, fan base, maybe. You know, I, I think it's very different when you talk about other sports in what's, this conversation. What's a, what's a week weeknight regular season it's, game going to be in Las exactly. Vegas? They've no. supported hockey. It was it was new. They have supported hockey. So that that's in the, the conversation. But to me, it, it, the, the league has to find these type of markets because you look at, you know, some, some teams that might not be doing well in terms of fan attendance, fan viewership, and that has been consistent in that area. Kansas City, I don't think, is going to have that problem. They do have an NBA-ready facility. It needs to be upgraded. There's no question about that. T-Mobile has been around for 20 years now. It does need, it, it, I know, it's crazy. It does need to be renovated, but it's an NBA venue that's downtown. I mean, the amount of conversations over the last year and a half, I'm sure, that you've been a part of, that's like, oh, we need a downtown team, and baseball might be in this conversation. Well, the NBA should be in that conversation, too. That's my point. You have a venue. You can renovate that. Um, I, I just think there is so many positives and so many reasons why Kansas, and I'm not saying it'll happen, but I do think there's a, a selling point. I do think there's something just like the world cup when we're like, Oh, Kansas city. I don't know if they can get a world cup. They're not big enough. Like, well, we got one. And there's a reason why we got one. It's the same thing for in the NBA expansion conversation. Kansas city should, should really think it long and hard about really going after this endeavor because it, it's, it's going to happen and you want to have a chance and you want to put your best foot forward and try to get that, get that done. And, and we'll see if it does happen.
All right, the next couple of, uh, at least the next one, maybe the next one or two episodes, you're going to be off working yeah. uh, at yeah. the uh, with the New Orleans Pelicans in the NBA draft. And so uh, I'll take over the reins for at least the next episode. Uh, but before we uh, we let you go, uh, the uh, don't you think we should have a, a hustler of the month? Absolutely. All right. So you Absolutely. can name that and and tell uh, tell us who caught your eye over this past month. Yeah. So I I was going hustler of the month of we talked about Joe Missoula a lot. You know, it, it's a coach like he fits this mold. Um, but I am going to give the hustler of the month to Drew Holiday, um, who I think is. Right now, the it's a real question. I think it's a debate. Um, I kind of am in between on it because I'm I'm a big Drew Holiday fan. Um, he was in New Orleans when I got the job in New Orleans. He's just an incredible guy. His story speaks for itself. His wife Lauren Holiday played on the U.S. Women's National Team. Um, they've gone through a lot together. He's just a class act human being. Uh, gives back to his community like the staple you want in your franchise. <laughs> like winner on and off the floor. Does all the right things. Um, you know, an Olympian won, won a gold medal. Um, I think it's, it's a conversation of him as a Hall of Famer. I think that's real. Uh, there's still more to come. He's 34 years old. Um, but just his impact on winning speaks for itself. And, you know, hustler of the month, it's not the guy that scores, scores the mo- most points and makes the most shots. Um, it's the guy that elevates everybody else that that's how I view hustler of the month it's the guy that does the little things it's the guy that's willing to do the dirty work it's the guy that's selfless and that's true holiday and that's how he's been his entire career and you know when he, we traded him from New Orleans uh to Milwaukee it was a tough tough thing we it was one of those things we had to do um and I think we were doing drew a solid because he was ready to go win and we were just in that rebuild phase and he's just always done things the right way and you talk to anybody in the league and they love Drew Holiday like you cannot love Drew Holiday because he's gotten better throughout his NBA career coming out of UCLA he can score he can shoot he can play point he can play off the ball he guards one through three sometimes one through four sometimes one through five Um, he just has this versatile ability where he's been durable he's been on the floor when he's been banged up he just sets the tone for a franchise and he's done that now he did it with us. He did it in Philly, um, and he did it in Milwaukee. Won a championship. He did it in Boston now and won a championship. And it's it's um, it's really impressive to see what he's done. I don't know if he'll be a Hall of Famer. He there's all these numbers and criteria that can go into it, but he's won two championships now with two different franchises, and he's a big part of why they won the franchise, why they won the title. And he's our hustler of the month, Drew Holiday, absolute legend in my book, um, and just his his journey, his career. Speaks for itself. It's been a remarkable run for Drew Holiday. All right. You got a lot of work ahead of you before this draft coming up. Uh, so until then, tell people uh, who uh, helps us uh, put together this podcast and bring this podcast to the basketball fans out there every month. Yeah, we got to give a big shout out and thank you to Charlie Hustle and Capital Investment Management uh, and everything they do to help us put this uh, put this podcast together. Um, it's our second year doing it, and they've been such such great um, great sponsors for us. They do great work. Um, definitely head over to Charlie Hustle too. They got some new gear out as as well. Um, got to got to plug that. But um, thank you for all you do and for all your help putting this podcast together. All right, and uh, until the next episode, remember this: Kansas City is for hustlers. 